Morning all. The chess Olympiad is nearly reaching a conclusion. There's 11 rounds and this was round 10, the mighty clash between China and United States of America. And this is the board free game clash. GM Ding, Lauren Lirin Ding, who's 2695, against Alexander Onischuk, 2666. So let's see this game. Uh, Liren starts off with d4 and we have d5, a solid response from Alexander. c4, e6, Queen's Gambit declined, Knight c3 and now Bishop e7 which is a very popular waiting move instead of Knight f6. Discouraging of course White's Bishop g5, so where else can this Bishop go? Well it goes to Bishop f4, this is a very common response to this waiting move. Knight f6 and now e3. White's playing this very solidly and logically. After castling, White plays knight f3. And then we see b6 sorting out this problem bishop. Bishop e2, bishop b7. Now after castles, black plays c5, increase, increasing the central tension quite a bit. And white now takes away from the center with d takes which creates some interesting pressure now. After b takes c5, is white going to give black hanging pawns or something with cd? No, actually, white plays queen b3, hitting the bishop on b7. And this might be quite awkward here. For example, bishop c6, there might be knight e5. How else um, to defend this bishop? Maybe if queen c8, then the queen might be a target on the c file. So this is a bit annoying and the purpose, one of the purposes are revealed behind D takes to create this sort of loose piece on B7. Queen B6 is played here and that looks like a, an adequate defence for the moment. But after Knight E5, White does seem to have an annoying uh, pressure on Black's position here and the possibility of, for example, Bishop F3 maybe in the future. And it was also putting pressure on d5 all the time. Knight c6, and in fact bishop f3 is played here. So there's a lot of pressure mounting on d5. And black goes to double white's pawns here, which is double-edged really. In one aspect, of course this pawn can be vulnerable and behind it is that pawn. But this a-file pressure might be significant. Here, a7 is a bit of a vulnerability as well. Black plays now knight b4, and then we see rook a5 preparing to double rooks potentially on a7, and also, of course, tying the bishop down a bit to c5. Rook fc8, and now doubling rooks, and it seems as though a6 black's, black's okay still after a6. But uh, a6 does create a kind of weakness of the last move, this b6 square. White pounces in with knight a4 to threaten to go to b6, but he's trapping in his own rook tactically, which black exploits. White takes on c6 now, and now rook takes c6, covers the b6 square. Nevertheless, there's some uncomfortable pressure here. Bishop g5, which is putting more pressure on d5 here. And the knight's also protecting b2 here, so this actually might be threatening bishop f6 and cd in this position. Rook c7 is played. And now, okay, there's also another idea. If the bishop is lured to f6, this c5 pawn is vulnerable. So in fact, white does play bishop takes f6 here. Uh, Knowing that c5 is vulnerable, black plays g takes f6, which uh, looks like an unfortunate structure for how things are going here at the moment. Black structure is getting a bit of d damage. c takes d, bishop takes. Now white gives black those two pawns together after bishop takes, but is forcibly winning a pawn now. Knight b6, forking the rook on a8 and the d5 pawn. Also a6 is loose. So black plays rook d8 offering a6. Well there's not, not much else to do. It's a very difficult position. So rook a6 but there's a pin here 
Rook C6. Okay. So in this position, it looks uh, as though, you know, is there a tactic available to White? Let's have a quick engine check here, because Knight takes D5 looks as though it might be an interesting move, or does it fail tactically? Engine is light white. This probably fails tactically. That's a, that's a huge blunder. Rook takes. I was just thinking, knight takes e7 check here. No, there's a back row, mate. <laughs> there's a back row, mate, at the end of all this. So that doesn't work. <laughs> so, okay. But anyway, unfortunately um, for Alexander, um, yeah, he's still under pressure here. Okay, g3 is played, which seems logical in, in that variation respect, to so actually be threatening knight d5 now, with the back row sorted. King g7, avoiding that tactic, because that won't be check. King f1, king comes to the center. Now this move allows, well, rook a7, and white doesn't mind these pawns becoming an under frontal attack. He's going to have his own rooks on the 7th now. Both rooks on the seventh. Okay, so how is the situation developing now? Rook takes f7, h5. And now coming over here to protect b2. Attacking basically b2 again. After takes, takes pressure on b2. But now rook c7, rook b5. And now b3 putting the brakes on these two pawns. So a pawn up, can White really um, get increase get to increase the advantage from here? So both kings being used aggressively. D4 looks a bit committal. Is Black actually doing that badly here from an engine point of view? That's useful to check here. There seems to be a small advantage for Black, but D4 looks committal. Let's just check ev engine evaluation. It goes a little bit tiny bit higher for white if that means anything I'm not really sure well the pawn is a bit vulnerable to attack and it's attacked with rook c4 so we have an exchange of weaknesses now if king e5 there might be um, b5 here with the idea of rook c5 get get the rooks off and king d3 later let's, let's show that actually I think king e5 might be a bit dangerous because of b4 yes b4 is a strong move here king d5 maybe just rook c5 no 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 king d3 first king d3 first and there's a sort of zugzwang if the rook moves then there's rook c5 picking up this pawn for example or no just just taking this pawn even simpler just take on d4 check so this 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 is a bit of a loose uh, vulnerability. This um, d4 pawn here. So black takes on b3, and after rook takes d4, is this really winnable though? Three to two over here. Rook a3, king f1. The king goes back to g2, and now he's heading. It seems for the h5 target to probe that. Some maneuvering now, offering exchange of rooks, that's refused. Building that bridge. Building another bridge to get the king maybe to f4 soon. Nope. So we see quite a lot of maneuvering in this game. Now g4 here. Now interestingly, in this position, um, tactical move basically g5 relying on a couple of checks to be able to recollect this pawn if fg so white is actually creating basically two past pawns potentially against whites against blacks one past h pawn uh, if we just check this position so fg and we just throw in a check and then throw in another check now we've got one past h pawn You'd think this this doesn't look like an advantage, much of an advantage at all. I don't know if maybe this was actually a good alternative for Black just to play F G here. If really this is White's best, I don't really 
I'm not really sure if HG. So apparently in this position, this should be equal with H4. Intriguing. Even though White's got these two pass pawns, this pawn's very dangerous now. So let's say F4, H3, Rook D2, King F5. Check. Either Rook, King move. Check. There's a lot of checks there. If the check, if the king goes up here, then h2. And that's resting check. So here, rook g3. Intriguing these, these rook and pawn endings. Looks about equal from an engine point of view, but. Uh, these pawns do look dangerous over here after this rook sack. Gone way out there. So g5. It looks as though th these are positions are uncomfortable to defend after long, very long, tiring sessions. Rook h1 was played uh, instead. Now, is that actually potentially a losing move in this this rook and pawn ending? Rook h1. The advantage did shoot up a little bit there. After rook d6, which is played, it goes to 1.40. Looking at the critical mistake, I'm afraid. Yeah, it could be fg was a way for black to play this technically and hope for the best with the h pawn versus these two pawns. Intuitively, it looks a little bit risky, maybe fg, but no, it seems. Okay, it seems unfortunate. Okay, now rook h1. If, if this is really giving white a big advantage after rook d6, so black takes, and then we see a very very powerful move. Maybe not expected. Maybe expecting was g takes f6. That doesn't give white much. G takes f6 here. Apparently rook b4. There's a blockade. They're fragmented. The way white plays this position is to keep that that pin on f6. He plays f4. Which is the engine recommended move, and now we have a quite a significant advantage for White. One point four eight. It just just shows the finesses of rook and pawn endings uh, to reach this position. And now we have we do seem to have two that nightmare scenario uh, of two connected passed pawns for White versus the single passed H pawn for Black. So if we look at rook h1 check, and we've got this rook behind the pawn there, and white is looking dangerously close to, um, well, king f5, he, he now plays a maneuver which exposes, it seems, this, this h pawn, now he just plays king g4 and king g3, with the rook protected. What can Black do? He's losing his H pawn. It will just be two pass pawns for nothing. Black resigned here, and uh, un unfortunately for, for the USA, this 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 was a very costly game. Um, the other games were drawn, so the USA lost this match against China two and a half, one and a half in round ten, the penultimate round. Um, I'm, I'm afraid for the USA. But uh, I mean, it just shows the difficulty, uh, intricacies of, and the cruciality of, of rook and pawn endings here. Um, if we just just go back to the critical position after g5, um, who would have thought F, fg is absolutely kind of? It seems absolutely critical here to play fg. So we assume rook. We can assume rook d6 check, rook d5. And here, the two alternatives, um, you know, rook takes g5 or hg. This this one looks. It's going to be difficult for for white surely because the pawns are not connected. You know, visu visually, you can do a visual inspection. The pawns are not connected. It, sh it should be quite troublesome because this is always going to be a target. You look at this position, it does does look as though it's a it's a narrow pathway here because. Because white is given these these two uh, pawns, but here it's more favourable um, 
than that other continuation. It seemed it seems similar, but the pawn is more advanced here, ready to run, only two steps away from queening now after h3. And we have this idea it's it's just it's just the rook basically is not behind the pawn. In the game continuation the rook was installed on h6. Now here the rook kind of like this I mean this this is a, a crucial idea to bring the king here to emphasize the queening with check. See otherwise that there might be um perpetual check possibilities. And you might ask, well hang on, is um is is king d4? What about king d4? Let's just check the intricacies here. We looked at king e4, which what about king d4? Is, is that obviously bad for another reason? If black queen's here, then it should should be absolutely fine with perpetual checks. Well, that was check. Now here, this this is going to be tricky uh, for white to win. V very tricky indeed. There's just loads and loads of checks around the place. It it should, and, and in fact, black are pawned down seems to be doing well because he's the first to get in the checks, and it looks dangerous for the king. In fact. So that that's a really murky position. Uh, so if we go back, I, I believe this this is the crucial this is the crucial uh, point where rook h1. It seems white plays very powerfully here to get this not only two pawn the past pawn scenario, but the rook behind black's past h pawn. With after f4, it, all all of those boxes are ticked. The rook is behind the pawn. The two pass pawns for white, and the king is mercilessly is going forwards. Paradoxically, to come backwards now to to get that pawn, prompting that pawn forward here. Uh, so the the game itself was kind of a very solid play from white, um, creating that a pawn vulnerability as a as an entry to. Get the rooks on the seventh pretty soon, and get into this rook and pawn ending, where well, basically his main advantage was. It turns out to be you know the, the pawns on the king side. Everything else gets liquidated. So it's how these these pawns on the king side are, are managed here, and White just ground down a win from this position rem quite remarkably, really. Um, But um, you know, maybe it sh maybe I guess it should have been drawn from from the brief analysis we've done instead of this horrible game continuation. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.